Well, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, <clears throat> this idea started back in 2020, and it's taken three years for fruition. But uh, we're very glad to have you all here in the museum tonight to hear about um, a local South Bay legend, John Van Hammersfeld. And um, we're going to have a video to kind of show his highlights of his career, and then we're going to have a slideshow with some conversation, and then we'll have time for some Q&A. So I don't know if you want to see. We'll start on something. I'll be exhausted by the end. <laughs> slide presentation together so we could kind of get a feel of uh, so we could get a feel of John's uh, origins in the South Bay and um, leading up, up through his youth into the 60s so if you look at this chart here of all these different graphics uh, we're only going to cover about half of the top row and that's, and that's going to take a while <laughs> so you know, this could be, this could go on for weeks. Anyway, uh, so we're gonna start here with um, John moving to California with his parents in 1950, settling up at Lanada Bay. Uh, he meets a good friend, Phil Becker, who had Becker surfboards here in, in, Her in Hermosa. Wow. We used to work for Rick Stoner, work, yeah, so he was a big shaper guy. And he nicknamed John the Hammer. And they used to go down. Let me see if this changes. They used to take that uh, 12 foot long Tom Blake paddleboard down the trail into Bluff Cove. And I think that's Phil Becker, the, the, the guy. Hey, Jerry, uh, uh, Phil, is, Phil is in the background there with a the little hat on. Oh, he got the little hat, OK. Yeah, and then uh, Jared, uh, Jared is in front holding the board. Yeah, and so these this group of ruffians were his friends that he went surfing with and skateboarding. Yeah, they, were, they were older. Or uh, Jared, uh, uh, you know, Phil and myself, we were all around the same age. And then and then Mike and uh, and and Jake's brother, uh, these three other people, they were all older. They were like. 20s or something like that. <laughs> so we were kind of just the Grammys. And um, so I, I grew up in the East and I um, uh, came to California. My father was working on the fly wing with a team that, that came from the East. And <clears throat> when we moved to, my grandfather built a house in Lanada <clears throat> Bay. And, um, and so at nine years old, in Palos Verdes, there wasn't very much going on but bean fields, you know, acres and acres of bean fields, you know, with the Japanese gardeners working away. And, uh, and, and so I had to walk probably like a quarter of a mile to the next, <clears throat> to see Phil Becker. And so Becker became this friend, you know, and then across the street uh, in an older Spanish house was the Eaton family, and the Eaton family had been there for 10 years already. And, um, and and uh, uh, Jared's father uh, ran the uh, Palos Verdes Golf uh, Club there, and and his wife, you know, and and, um, and and Jared's mother was a famous kind of uh, 1920s rich lady dancer <laughs> with all the fringe and everything. And so as we melted into the 50s um, all together. Uh, well, we, we found somebody who was 16 and they had a truck and, they had, and he had these surfboards and we would go on these trips up and down the coast um, from Redcon to La Jolla, depending on the, on the weather and the, 
and, and the waves and the <clears throat> particular times and all that. And so my parents would just give up and they would let me go for like the whole weekend, you know? And then I'd come back and they'd be watching, <clears throat> watching Lassie and I was, <laughs> what kind of a world do I live in? But uh, <clears throat> so, the, so the surf gang, you know, there were like five or six of us and, and we would go up and down the coast you would then meet all these other younger surfers too as well. So it was a whole generation that was being, you know, entering the ocean with these surfboards, uh, with this history behind it, you know. And then there were the filmmakers, you know. Uh, Bud Brown used to show his movies here in the, in the auditorium when we were in high school. Um, so, so surf, uh, you know, and Hermosa Beach was like Surf City. Uh, that was its uh, center, you know, for this huge generation in the South Bay. And, uh, and at, at 19, I, I, <coughs> I <lo> <coughs> nostalgia. <laughs> I, <coughs> I left the arts, or I left the scene. The surf scene, uh, because my mother was an artist, an artist who went to art school, and so at thirteen she started teaching me, and <clears throat> so uh, I was dyslexic, and because of that they dropped certain classes, and I had two classes of art at El Segundo High School, but that was like you know ten miles away, and I had to go back and forth with, in different cars with different people, and so on the weekends uh, surfing was much more interesting than high school. <laughs> and and uh, each time we went to these towns, you know, there'd be parties and all kinds of scenes, and then the surf was up. And <clears throat> just a, <clears throat> an amazing scene. So I, I just wanted to bring attention to some of the names on here, you know, like Dewey Weber from Hermosa and yeah. Mike Doyle, and then, you know, some of the people like Gidget, you know, so he's up there in Malibu surfing with all these kind of legendary icons and kind of this golden era of surfing. And then down in Orange County, he's, he's meeting up with people like um, Mickey Doran and, and Phil Edwards, who became part of the Endless Summer movie. And John Severson, we'll see later on, he worked for. So it's just kind of like, you know, this early beginning, you know, he kept these relations as time went on. So. And then at 19, I went to Art Center College of Design. Uh, uh, my father saw my mother never making any money. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I, th this is the pictures of him in El Segundo High. I'd just like you to comment maybe on your art teacher and any kind of, any kind yeah, of influence. Mr. Tommy, that, yeah. So Tommy really. <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> He was a big influence. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a, gave you your freedom to kind of explore whatever, yeah. Just turn the whole thing over to me. Yeah. Okay. Good guy. So this is this is an interesting period. He finishes high school. He decides he's going to be a ski bum in Aspen. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're like 20 years old, ski bum in Aspen. <laughs> and uh, my grandfather <clears throat> wrote a check for $2,400 and off I went <laughs> for six months. And, you know, in a way, the family would let me go. And that was the. <clears throat> you really caught me here. <laughs> And then um, he came back after he came back after Aspen, and um, kind of hung out in Hermosa, you know, down here at the lighthouse. He saw Miles Davis playing, and the Insomniac was still going at this time. So he got to see Chambers Brothers, and then later on we're going to see he did a, a poster for the Chambers Brothers, and people like Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. So what was that? beaten it seeing life down there in Hermosa at that time. And so the surfers were kind of stationed at the at the Frosties and then Pier Avenue uh, down here at Pier then had these had the uh, you know had the um, uh, the, the jazz uh, uh, store there and then and then the beatniks and then the Hell's Angels were over at the cafe. So you had the culture right there. And so when you went in town, the town was like that. 
So we had our own sort of 60s uh, hip scene, you know, so we were hipsters in a way. So I, um, uh, I left for um, art school. I went to, uh, I had gone to Art Center and then uh, did a magazine and then became surfer and then that became the endless summer. And then, uh, and then I went to art school, and then the art school turned into being an art director of uh, um, Capitol Records and doing the Beatles, and and, uh, uh, and all that. And I was into it like a whole other world. Yeah. So this this uh, Bing boards poster was basically your first commercial job. That was my right? first poster. Yeah. And. Uh, so how did how did you meet up with Bing to do a poster for him? Uh, you're, I, you're a young kid. I, mean. I surfed with him. Yeah. <laughs> and he knew you were an artist, and, yeah. and then well, uh, he was always a he was an entrepreneur. You know, he had a, a sense of everything and, and about people and all that. Um, and and uh, you know, he gave me an opportunity, and that was the first poster. It was printed and everything. And then you know, I did the magazine, and then the magazine. Turned into a piece of jealousy that uh, John Severson just couldn't stand. <laughs> so he hired me. <clears throat> and so I did about nine magazines for him, you know, and then stumbling through the whole thing uh, and going off to Art Center on uh, three days a week, um, uh, you know, for my design education and still living in Dana Point. So you can imagine the drive to the center of Los Angeles and then back to Dana Point at night. You know? yeah. so. And so, so from all, the, you know, from so this all was that, this was the um, the first magazine he did, Surfing Illustrated. It was published here in Hermosa Beach, and um, again, it's a who's who of people. If you can't read this this lettering, but there was Leroy Granis was a contri contributing photographer, Don James was a contributing photographer, and Warren Miller, who had started his uh, skiing movies, he was part of this magazine. And, and you kind of started this with Rick Griffin, who I don't know if you're familiar with Rick Griffin, the psychedelic art poster uh, artist who also grew up in PV. So how did this whole Surfing Illustrated idea come up? And you know, you get this cast of characters to work with you. You know, so uh, you know, all these kind of strange jealousies and all that. So, so Rick had done the front cover of Surfing Magazine and, and he had Murphy on there. And, uh, and, and I came down to the beach and I said, oh yeah, I'm doing a surfing thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I got, uh, so my uh, uh, girlfriend had a girlfriend uh, next door to her who went, who was dating, uh, well, Phillips, you know, so I said, well, well, Phillips, he has a movie and all that, you know, maybe, maybe he'll finance it. And so we had the meeting, and then he decided he would finance it. Uh, as crazy as he was, you know, I, I somehow or another got through it and published it down the street in, in uh, Hollywood Movie or at, uh, at the storefront there. And uh, and then it was distributed, and then uh, John Severson sees it. He's terribly jealous, you know. He he uh, uh, he, he, sit, he uh, uh, wants to meet me, so. Uh, so, but it's really Rick Griffin who comes to the studio and says, John is really mad at you, uh, uh, so, you know, you should talk to him. I said, well, you know, pick up the phone. <laughs> so we pick up the phone, and, and uh, 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 I have I John have Severson on the line. <laughs> and he says, I'll meet you halfway, you know, in Long Beach, you know, and we'll talk about this. So uh, I was working at Northrop learning how to make publications. And my, again, my father wanting me to make a dollar. You know? um, and he got me the job there. But you know, between my father and I, it was always a kind of a game. So he, so I do the magazine. I get the job as the art director of Surfer Magazine. Uh, and, and Severson moves me to Dana Point, you know, sets me up in the house and everything. Couldn't believe the service. It was incredible. My father's jaw was. <laughs> you know, at the same time, uh, you did the Clark Foam logo, which was pretty iconic into itself because until they went out of business in the, I think it was the 80s. Probably 90% of the uh, surfboards that were shaped were done with Clark foam, and I found that 
Very interesting that you did their, their logo for them. Yeah, the love the shapers had to skin that off the bank. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, a legendary thing. Well, the thing is, when I was there, you know, it, it was the new foundation of the surf scene. It was taking surfing away from the South Bay, you know, and a new industry being created in Bay Point. And, and, uh, and, and so the advertisers were Clark Fowle, Hobie Alter, you know, John Severson and, and his films and, and the magazines, and Bruce Brown uh, at, uh, at the end of the summer. Um, so, so I'm, I'm at the, uh, I'm in the studio there during the day, and then I go to uh, our center at night, and, and uh, I, I meet this, I uh, meet this guy, Paul Allen, who's the agent. For, uh, for Bruce Brown, and and in that in that relationship in this little tiny town of Dana Point with like seventeen thousand people, and, uh, you know, growing these industries, uh, you know, he decides that he's he wants a business card, so I create a business card for him. And he likes it, so he says, "Okay, I want to introduce you to Bruce Brown." So I go over there, and and uh, and, and uh, he has to say, "Well, you know, John works for." Uh, John Superson, and this is like uh, Bruce Brown's arch enemy. It's Bruce Brown's. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, get a little closer to the microphone. Your boss is telling you. Yes, absolutely. All right. Don't bring up his parents again. <laughs> So, uh, so I go off to Art Center and, uh, you know, uh, with an idea, and then I set up this uh, uh, shot at, um, um, you know, Salt Creek, and we arrived there, and then I was the art director of the shot, and then another guy, t uh, uh, Bagley, has a 4 by 5 camera, and, and so the film is sent off to get developed, and then it turns into a, a, a continuous tone, and I'm given this transparency. So I go in town, and uh, in town I could get this Dayglo paper, and I could have it turned into a Kodalit. Uh, and so uh, in my modernism of, of Art Center, you know, in this little tiny provincial town, they never knew what they got. You know, it was just some guy from out of town that works here, you know, came in with his poster. I don't understand it. Where's the beach? Where's the sky? And where's the color? And, uh, and, and so that poster, well, I left town, you know, so to go back to school uh, full time, and then somebody ambushed me to design their magazine called Surf Guide. And uh, John was really mad at that, and he said, John, or tell John, you'll never work in this industry. <laughs> so I <clears> went <throat> to my, gra <clears throat> my grandfather. My, gra my grandmother is in the yeah. stock business, you know, so she has money and she says, okay, you can go back to school, we'll pay for it, get a car, blah, 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 you know. <laughs> so I'm in uh, Chenard for about a year, about a year or so, um, and towards the end of it, it's 1966, and uh, a kid runs into this, uh, into this classroom and he has the, uh, this two-page ad for the endless summer, my posters, you know. Uh, uh, the New York Times, you know, and he said, my mother pulled this out and gave it to her. Said, what, did, you, did you ever see it? <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so then uh, Warren Miller was on the phone with his assistant, and they said, hey, we want that poster for you uh, <clears throat> in, <clears throat> in New York. So I get the poster, and I'm just uh, out, out of school for the summer vacation, and I'm hanging out at the uh, Ferris Gallery, uh, and I have a job upstairs, and they're doing art forum there, and, and uh, Ed Shea and, uh, uh, and, and Pat Blackwell are these two people that I'm going to lunch with, and uh, they, they say at a certain point, they say, so, you know, you can get some work at Capitol Records, you know. Can we slow down just a bit? Pardon me? Can we slow down just a okay. bit? Okay. Right. I'm going to take you back, just one picture here, because this was the... Um, the art studio when he had at Server Magazine. So, you know, he's got his uh, 
old school tools. I guess, do you still use some of those? Oh, yeah. 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 And, um, and then before he went on, uh, he got a job with uh, Larry Stevenson of Makaha Skateboards. And um, to do this magazine yeah, called Surf Guide. <laughs> I'm not going to say the skateboard anything. revolution. <laughs> yeah. So that, this, this is kind of interesting because that's uh, that's you on the a motorized skateboard. Yes. Of all things. Right. I don't know. Is that some kind of Larry Stevenson? I'm a point, actually. Was that, was that a Larry Stevenson experiment or something? Uh, uh, it was just a salesman. He's behind there. He oh. came by Makaha, you know, and they wanted to take a picture of me with the magazine. And that's and that's you in the center image there. I skateboard. Yeah, yeah, I would skateboard on the ramp in front of Surfer Magazine. A salesman came by and gave me one of the McCall skateboards in 63. So I'm, you know, doing all my <coughs> fancy moves and everything like surfing on this board, right? Yeah. And then, uh, and then I leave town and I end up at this magazine with half the building is they're making McCall skateboards and the other half is the publication. Right. And that's Surf Guide magazine where you, I guess you just one issue there then, no? Yeah. Yeah. They were, uh, um, they couldn't afford the printing. But then they went ahead and printed. They went ahead and printed. <laughs> <laughs> so informal. <laughs> okay, and, and uh, so and that. Uh, okay, so that world uh, of of skateboards, you know, between you know going out to uh, Topanga and then back back into the magazine and, and watching this phenomena uh, happen and then out of, out of the data point comes the, uh, the Hobie uh, skateboard which goes national, it's like sold all over the place. And so it actually uh, uh, puts uh, Lakaha out of business and it's too much competition. So he had it for a while, you know, it was just a, like a, a year and a half, maybe two years, he had this phenomena under his under his thumb, yeah. and then and then it just all got away. Yeah. And look what happened, huh? Yeah, look where it is now. Yeah, so this is interesting because now you're you're 23 years old. You've had these incredible rides, you know, with three different surfer magazines. You've had this international poster, and uh, you know John Van uh, John Severson gives you his. Uh, is your fortune in the industry. Yeah. <laughs> you're never gonna work in it again. Yeah. And so you're twenty three years old and you're like, what the heck? And and you leave the industry. You leave yeah. you leave the surfing life. And um, you go to this place called Ferris Gallery and uh, Ferris is the epicenter of pop art in Los Angeles on the right. West maybe the West Coast. I don't know if you can say anything similar. This is the place where Andy Warhol would have his exhibits. And um, so you leave the surf industry, you, you start going to Chenard, um, and you're working and, and kind of living here at, at this... Uh... Yeah, I'm living over by the school. Okay. And then, uh, you know, but the art scene was always on La Cienega with all the different galleries, so that all the artists sort of... So what were you doing in Ferris? With, what, what were they introducing you to? Or, you know, what, what, what was going on inside Ferris at the time? Uh, Ferris, Ferris was like the place to be during that time, there were a lot of galleries on the strip, but it was like the, uh, it was the beginning of the pop art uh, movement. It had all the contemporary stuff. Um, I can't remember the head guy that ran the whole thing. But um, uh, all those artists became, you know, like real famous mm -hmm. out of that little building. And then, you know, kind of, you know, I, I was talking earlier that it seems kind of the Forrest Gump of artists all of a sudden. <laughs> he gets a job at Capitol Records and he designs a Beatles album cover. So how did that happen? Well, yeah, so, uh, so I would go to lunch with uh, uh, Pat Blackwell. Is it okay? <laughs> So I was um, discovered after my uh, and Andrew Shea, and so they said, uh, you know, uh, I was looking around for some work, and they said, well, you should go up to Capitol Records. They they, they they have work. And Pat said, I've been doing things with them. So I so I arrived uh, at um, 
I get my appointment, and I, I arrive there in front of George Rostocki at his office there, and, and he runs the art services. And so I, uh, I have my portfolio, and I show him my surfing magazines, you know, and we talk about Chouinard a little bit, you know, and then and then I pull out the end of the summer poster. And he reaches over in his cabinet and he picks out the soundtrack to the end of summer <laughs> as an album, you know, but I didn't say anything because <laughs> it was just done by another company. He says, I have a job for you. I'll call you in three weeks. So um, in three <clears throat> so the three weeks goes by, I get the call, you know, and they he didn't have answering services in that day, no iPhones, you know. So you had to stay by your phone. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, and so there I, there I am uh, going up uh, just out of, the, out, of, out of, you know, out of nothing, you know, going up uh, Vine Street into Hollywood, like the total opposite of whatever I came from. Right? You know, I go up the elevator and, and I come out on the floor, you know, I'm out of the floor, and they ask me to wait. I have a can of cigarettes. I was always smoking can of cigarettes. And, and, I, and the, the woman said, one of the secretaries says, hey, you have to come in and see George. So I, so, I, so I go in to see George, and I have the cigarette, right? You know, and, I'm, and, I, and I showed my magazines, and I'm watching the cigarette, the ash on the cigarette, fall into the floor. You know, as, I, as I pick the poster up, you know, <laughs> I'd show it to him. And he reaches over and he gets the album cover uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the End of the Summer soundtrack, you know, and all of that comes together in, a, in a, 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 a command, I have something for you. And so, um, so after the three weeks, waiting for a phone call, you know, I, I, I go over to Capitol, I go up the stair, or, you know, up the uh, uh, elevator, I get off, and I walk over to this open door, you know, and standing there is this businessman in a blue suit and tie and everything, you know, with his haircut and totally corporate guy, the vice president of the CRDC, Capital Records Distribution Company. So he signed the Beatles to the label. Uh, and so he was like very powerful, you know, and he looks at me and he says, you know what, you, I'm going to give you a job and you can't turn me down. So, yeah. so I say, okay, well, fine, building? that's good. So he says, I have a, an office downstairs. So I get the office next to George Osaki <laughs> to run and to run the, the, the distribution business while while Osaki is running the art department. So very very confusing and, and very political. But the the reason why I was there is because I reflected the the generation. Uh, of the Beatles. I was the same age as John Lennon. Yeah, so someone just asked, that that's the building that looks like a stack of records yeah, in Hollywood, so yeah. yeah. So, so, William Pereira, yeah. Because he was the architect? Yeah. Okay. So uh, just to give you an idea, I mean, he, he's done over 300 album covers. This is a, a, a picture of 40. So you'd have to take eight more of these pictures and stretch them out to show the, the enormity of this work that he did as an album cover designer. You know, I don't know if you want to talk to any of them there. Or, <laughs> I, know, I know, I know that one thing that in listening to some well, of you, know, they're, they're not all the same. They're all different. Yeah, they're all different because they had to be different. You know, because uh, every album cover had a life. Uh, and the life was based upon Billboard, and so went to the top. That was the last time anyone wanted to see that album cover. So it had to be replaced with something different. <clears throat> so in my art education, I was able to be a photographer, an artist, and, uh, and a designer. So I had I crossed skills. So I could actually do everything myself. Uh, I didn't have to have other people working for me. Um, and, and I had that flexibility, and I had these ideas. But I also, uh, business-wise, I found a factor who uh, would advance me 80% uh, uh, of the fee in the front. So I would go to the producers, not to the label. The label would pay me $1,000. The, man, the manager or the producer would give me 10000 or 20000 to do. And I would do the campaign. So album covers were not just album covers. They were campaigns in print, you know, and billboards and all that. So, uh, uh, so I had a reputation, you know, and uh, so meeting the Stones was like really, you know, 
uh, there's Mick Jagger and, and uh, uh, Keith Richards on a couch uh, in, a, in a mansion uh, in Bel Air. Uh, and, uh, you know, the other stones were here and there, you know, around in the rooms and everything. And, and so I was showing them my work. And, and, and I showed them the uh, uh, Jefferson Airplane. And was Jefferson Airplane in America was the Rolling Stones of America. So Jagger and I, you know, kind of hit it off, you know, and uh, he was, uh, we ended up sitting together on, on an ottoman, and there was a knock at the door, and, uh, and the photographer, um, uh, I can't remember his name right this second, uh, came in, and, and who was very famous and from the 50s and all that, and done these photographs, so, so uh, I, said to, I said to Jagger, yeah, he'd be great, you know, because of what he, he does. And so he took the van downtown um, and, and, uh, and, and made all kinds of pictures, and, uh, which was, it was a little movie picture. Or it's like a movie camera. And then that film, he would make contact sheets. And then that was what the pictures were on the, on the uh, inside cover. But the outside cover was from a tattoo shop, I guess, you know, where, where he had shot it. And, and those freaks that were uh, displayed on there was sort of what the scene was all about, you know. So between Jagger and I, we sort of felt they were like kind of really putting the whole scene together right there, you know, at that moment. Um, that was the uh, Exile on Main Street. Exile on Main Street. Yeah. Album, yeah. It's incredible. Um, so I guess time-wise, you're kind of uh, multitasking here. You're working. Uh, for capital, but you're also doing One freelance years, work yeah. with uh, all, all West Magazine. Labels, yeah. I don't know if you're a member of more than just capital, you're a freelance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There is a book like seven yeah. big labels, yeah. But this um, Mike Salisbury was the art director of West Magazine. I don't know if you remember that was a supplement to the mm -hmm. LA Times. And um, John was a, um, a freelance illustrator. Well, there. We had a studio, so he would call me to do a thing for it. And all different types of projects. Yeah, some were photographs, some were drawings. Um, that's just the way my creativity works. I, I have a have a different different things that I can do with different mediums. Um, and that was the unique thing. But you know, like the <clears throat> I would go on these in the eighties. I would go on these uh, tours around the country to design groups and show my work, right, and, and do a lecture. And, and the, all these images were all different in all kinds of different ways and everything. Well, they ran their studios. There was always a principal designer, but they had designers working for them. You know, so they, they couldn't understand how one person could do this. <laughs> so that was always a funny kind of contradiction. And then, if that wasn't enough, at the same time, um, you started this company called Pinnacle Production, and you called it Kingsley Studio, and you decide that you're going to promote uh, rock concerts, rock concerts yeah. at the Shrine Hall in uh, in LA. And um, you know, where I don't know, a lot of energy going on. There. Uh, okay, so Brown Banks, uh, my vice president, my boss, you know, was. Uh, we went back and forth about everything. I was learning about the industry. And then I would get on an airplane and go to San Francisco to see Rick Griffin, who was doing posters for the uh, rock shows there, uh, for the film or the Avalon. And uh, Victor Moscoso was there at Mouse and, and Kelly and all that. So, uh, you know, being an artist, uh, we had rapport and it was all great, you know. So then when I came back, on the, uh, from those weekend trips, you know, I, I was at the studio one day and I said, you know what? I want to do these environments, but we have to have rock music for it, you know. So I, I got, I got built, you know, I developed a, 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 a light show, I developed a campaign, I got these two business guys from uh, SC, and, uh, and, and we started this company called Pinnacle Productions. And so within that year, uh, you know, we did like 16, 17 dates, you know, uh, 43 some odd groups from around the world. Uh, that pissed off all the managers and everybody in the booking business.
this and everything. So, um, and and uh, and there was a drug scene going on, you know, in Laguna, which started to come into LA called the Brotherhood. And so the Brotherhood would come with suitcases of money to the office, you know, and they would say, you know, we want to meet Eric Clapton. Here's ten thousand. So this this uh, this you know this money, <laughs> dirty money. And then on the other hand, I'm from Palos Verdes, and and, uh, and it's the Vadonovich uh, uh, family and uh, the Tuna Company who's putting money into the company. In the pinnacle? In the pinnacle. Okay. So we've got we got a thirty and a ninety thousand loan dollar loan from that. Yeah. Start so how do you how do you picture this thing at the end of the year? You know, you have you have that money and then you have that money. <laughs> <laughs> so we had the full But I want to walk you through some of the um, the poster art from this period because I, I love this psychedelic artwork and um, and you know there was there was a psychedelic art poster scene in San Francisco, and they call them the big five up there, like Rick Griffin, Muscovo, Kelly, Mouse, I forgot who the other one was. But really there was, you know, the, the, the one guy down here that was doing all this same type of art and, and just as good or better than those five up there. Um, this was the first concert uh, with Buffalo Springfield, Grateful Dead, and Blue Cheer. Um, I don't know. Yeah, so you can imagine doing the Beatles Magical Mystery Tour, you know, uh, in, in like two days <laughs> in the studio there, uh, mm -hmm. at, you know, being paid off the books by uh, Brown Meggs, you know, bringing it in and he says, okay, we'll print it, you know, and then meanwhile I'm doing the poster for these bands, you know, so he, uh, he just couldn't believe that I would abandon him. <laughs> and go off and be a rock promoter with what he really taught me about the distribution of ideas. Yeah. This one's an iconic classic, you know, the Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. Um, and then later on, you know, it's interesting because some of these posters morphed over time into like this was a was a year two thousand version. Yeah. That you did, so you know, you're still playing with the same image and. And, and revising it, and it's still iconic. Both well, of them. You know, you know, so the so the Hendrix, the Hendrix um, poster, you know, was the first time I really had a drawing to do. That I, you know, a new drawing, not a you know not a, a continuous tongue drawing, but a line drawing. And so that uh, so that came out of all these drawing sessions with Viscoso and Rick Griffin in San Francisco. And so I sat down and, and, and did this drawing. You know, I couldn't believe it. So I put it in the drawer. Mm -hmm. And I went off to, uh, to work. And, and maybe a month later or so, something like that, they, uh, my partner said, oh, we got Jimi Hendrix at the auditorium. And so, uh, so I, I pull this thing out. And then I look at the typography as, the, uh, you know, as, a, as a kind of a more contemporary way of doing it. So you can, can read it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I sent it off to the printer and printed, you know, it, it printed really well and, and it was put up in all the stores and her ads in the newspaper and all that. And it was just like a big breakthrough. That was the first of my new drawings. Now, the, the, the one on the, uh, on the other side here is that that's uh, 70, no, uh, 97. Mm. And and so I'm revisiting it, mm -hmm. and I don't like the hair in the early one, so I'm redoing the hair and really trying to make it a gentleman, and uh, made a fine art print of it uh, in silkscreen, and, uh, and then started doing those silkscreen images, these big large images in, in the 90s, uh, mm. or in the 2000s. This one, I think, has lived a long life. Yeah, uh, still lives. Yeah. <laughs> Jefferson Airplane, Charlie Muscle Light, the Sailor people, and Clear Light. So, but I've seen a lot of versions of this through the, through the decades, right? So, the, so uh, my uh, Coronado studio, which was over by Otis uh, downtown in LA, 
um, they had junk stores uh, everywhere. And, and in the 60s, that was like a favorite place on the weekend to go and, and look at all these different books and photographs. And so it was a photograph sitting in a, in one of, a junk shop. And my girlfriend said, uh, uh, it was OK, why don't you buy it? You know, so I buy it and I put it in a drawer. You know, and so along comes my uh, uh, partners, and they're going to do the Jefferson Airplane. I said, OK, well, that's, that's an interesting thing. So I'm going to sell it as the Jefferson Airplane, the, the northern Indians, the hippies, right? Mm -hmm. Coming to the southern. Mm -hmm. So it was like a, a, a symbolic image. Yes. And then make it very psychedelic, and then uh, and use the, uh, the typography like that Indian belt that you would get at a trading store. Right. Yeah, I can see that. And uh, the uh, the uh, Hendrix and the Indian poster are are you know probably the, the kind of trademark of my work, I guess, mm -hmm. during that time. This one's interesting. It's a I don't know if you can see it from the, where you're at, but the lettering is all done with uh, human figures. So oh, that's kind of an interesting. It. You got an interesting model to, to help you? Yeah, I, I had taken acid. Somebody <laughs> 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 And I woke up in the morning and I said, wow, suspended in space. Wow, this is really good. You know? So uh, my girlfriend brought over her friend and she was willing to take her clothes off and lay on the floor. <laughs> and then made those into uh, uh, line uh, resolutions and then assembled it. Uh, and, then, and then the Indians in silver way in the, in a, 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 in the background there. And then the shaded sides and everything in the car and, the, and, and the, what would be the next uh, cream poster, uh, which is the, uh, the the girl with the hat at, at the base. So uh, this is in a sequence. There's three posters that stack on top of each other. So the Indian was uh, one of the first ones, and this one comes in, um, you know, second or third, something like that. There's like three posters that hook together that go up the side of the wall. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a collaboration poster with uh, Victor Moscovo and Rick Griffin, your buddy from... So I would need the art director. I would uh, send it to them. I was drawing with them on the weekends, and I just said, oh, here, why don't you take this? And this, this really starts their cartoon drawing. So they're moving from, uh, um, from the San Francisco poster style into a new thing, uh, which uh, is greeted by... Um, What's his name? Uh, is that is that magazine? Crumb. Yeah, our crumb comes into the San Francisco scene. He's moved, uh, you know, into one of the places in Northern California, uh, and so we all kind of meet together, and and this uh, whole new scene, the whole new Zap comic book scene starts. So it's really an extension of my drawing, and I gave the poster to them, and it was inspirational, you know, and uh, to both of them, and and. Uh, you know, the audience, per se. Our crumb uh, did the Fritz the Cat. Yeah. 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 Keep on trucking. And keep on trucking. Yeah. 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 But, you know, his, his drawings in his staff magazine were, were social comments about his society, you know, which is so interesting. So he had moved away from things that he was doing before and he got into making these social comments, you know, on, on, on the way people live. And, in cities. Here's, so your buddy, that, here's your old buddies, the Chambers brothers, who used to play the Insomniac, and um, Velvet Underground, Dr. John, the Night Trip. I'm not really, I don't know if I know that music. But uh, this, yeah, is kind of, this is kind of a different, you know, taking away all the color and going Yeah, but this again, it's, style. A, it's a Zap drawing. So right. you know, I'm, I'm leaving San Francisco, coming back to the studio in that way, sitting down and making a poster and bringing that uh, collaboration, you know, of, of the three of us into these posters. Mm. Victor Moscoso was uh, about eight years old, so to Rick Griffin, he was sort of like a father figure. <laughs> and, he, and he was uh, a teacher from the San Francisco Art Institute. He went to Yale and came from New York. And so uh, when he came into the uh, San Francisco uh, 
poster scene, he had his own company. And he, and he produced posters that, that competed with the whole scene. So uh, he sort of integrated himself in into all the other artists and all that. So, um, so his style um, of drawing uh, is different than Rick's and more uh, closer to mine. And then my drawings are, you know, what they are. Yeah. I kind of did a faux pas here because uh, John's poster is actually the one in the upper right corner. Yeah. But I. So I, I would really give that away. Yeah. <laughs> I like the colorful one. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize that till today, so yeah. <laughs> I apologize. And actually, the, the way this is set up is it has a, a red light and a um, a red light and a blue light, so so it actually moves. It's animated. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's uh, one for Pink Floyd, Jeff Beck, and Blue Cheer, and and somehow you decided to uh, incorporate your face into that heart in the middle. Yeah. So it was a, a collaboration, uh, uh, what's his name, Bob Free, uh, came, for the, came to stay for a week or something like that. So we did that poster together. So I did the typography. Uh, he did those sort of ellipses coming from space. Uh, I took a photograph of a, you know, uh, the plastic glove and the ball, and he brought in the wings, and the heart came there, and my face went into the heart. Nice. I think this was the last concert at the Shrine? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, uh, it's a drop in. I think it was $900,000. Yeah, $90,000 yeah, 90, yeah. $90, down the drain. <laughs> down the drain. Down the drain. Right. So well, where they expected that were my partners, you know, with the with the Brotherhood's money, $90,000, decided that they were going to have this Hollywood uh, whole thing and uh, make a fortune. Well, didn't do that. You know? So that cowboy is really the starting of Crazy World Inn. That's the Johnny face in the beginning. So this, this was your uh, lifelong friend Collaborator, you know, he, he migrated to San Francisco, but you grew up together here in PD. Um, so, you know, just a little bit about your relationship and you know, how you inspired each other. Uh, I met, well, you know, I met Rick. Rick was like 15, I was 19. I was coming back from Aspen and I met him at Haggerty's one afternoon. And he said, Oh, you're going to art school and all that. Wow, you know. And he was a cartoonist and very well connected within his own kind of group of people and supported by them. You know? And so me coming into it as, as somebody who was going to go to an important art school uh, was, uh, uh, you know, I was a hero, you know. So, <laughs> so in that, we, uh, I would see him surfing. And, and at the time, he did a, uh, a cartoon of Murphy on the cover of Surfer Magazine. And I was sort of envious of that. And that's really how uh, surf guys, surf, I mean, um, uh, um, Surfer Illustrated? Yeah, Surfer Illustrated comes about. You know, as he comes up, you know, we meet each other at the beach and I tell him I'm going to do this magazine. And uh, so it was a little bit like that, even with the rock you know? I mean, A little competitive? Yeah, competitive. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm art director at the CRDC and he's this great, you know, poster artist in San Francisco doing these posters. I'm doing album covers, and he's doing posters. And so there's an ambient kind of way there. Yeah. Great guy though. Yeah. Great artist. So that was it. Um, Any questions from the floor? Go ahead. What are you working on now? What are you working on now? Uh, a mural for uh, uh, Need a feed. I'm doing a, a, a cowboy thing there, which should be. I'm struggling with it because it's figurative. 
that stuff like my formal uh, collages. And speaking of murals, I guess you saw the El Segundo mural, but you all have seen the, there's a mural on 14th Street that you did down next at the underground. So, any other questions? So murals were big, you know, and then uh, the, along comes the um, COVID, and that's the end of it. Uh, but coming out of that uh, is the um, uh, NFT, see? So we were, I was in that for like three years or so, which was epic. Fantastic as it kind of is falling off. And so now I'm going, I've been playing with uh, AI, which is like uh, when I taught at Cal Arts, you know, I had these students, which I would teach them about design for a full semester, and then I would teach them about art for a semester, so that when they would get a job, they could think, and think from the terms of being a designer and a communicator but also they had uh, a feeling for art as it was. So that's a little bit the way AI works, is that uh, you give it, you give it your, your drawing, and then you take Picasso, and you tell it to, to, to come up with something. So it's like a student. And so the student you know, goes into, into pumping out all these absolutely incredible things. You know? <laughs> but it's all in low res. Um, and I don't know how to use that, but I, but in a way, uh, in art, you can use them. But the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to then redraw what comes out of it in my in my style and in, in what they're kind of like pushing me into. So it's changing my style in a way. So I guess I'm you, off into a whole other world. You kind of you kind of did that with your whole career. You you just kept on adopting new technology and embracing it and. Being creative with it. Yeah, my, <coughs> my father <coughs> would always. <coughs> yeah, that's going so well. <laughs> Another question? Yeah. So, in regards to you're getting into AI and all that, so I, my question is how does that kind of compare to such a bulk of your work going you know, back in the 60s? Which is all, to me, so much about your personal energy coming out of your, your hands and your brains. Because everything's about energy. Bottom line, at the end of the day, it's all about energy. So the way I look at it. But that, because that, when it's from your hand, to me, it has. Okay, all right. So. It's more energy. Does it, does it go down at all when you start getting so involved with tech, technical, the machines, and all that stuff? And it kind of gets washed down or something, do you think? So since 2000. I divided my world between uh, digital collage and analog, doing drawings. So as a dyslexic, I always like the way I think, and it comes down through my left hand into a pencil or pen and is jotted out, very much like AI. It's like a, a little sketch. And then from there, I develop that sketch and do a real hard line drawing. And then I take that over to another room, and I have that vector you know, through a photograph, take a picture with my phone, and then it, and then put that into the computer, and then and it's vectored, and then it can be collaged, and that's really the way the mural is looking at. So and that was all collaged together uh, in in um, in a strip that was like three inches high and probably twelve inches long, and so uh, and it was like three megabytes, right, as a as an email to the uh, a digital company that makes the work, that makes the the, the, uh, app, the the final mural, and so they break it all up into strips and print it out, and there's a guy that is, uh, that uh, applies it to the wall, and uh, and it's permanent, and the color doesn't really fade, and so I just skip by painting and paints and. All also, now, and <laughs> brushes. So in, in that regard, too, that, that big uh, ceiling that you did, the muralized ceiling that you did in Las Vegas, yeah, was, was that projection or? Well, that was digital too. That so digital. yeah, so I had a power book that had, you know, so my work went into symbologies. So I developed everything as a symbol. It's all good symbols. Yeah, and so those symbols that uh, could be animated. So we had this big, huge computer and a, and a, a, a 
like a dome screen that was like 360 feet long. No, 1,500 feet tall. 1,500 feet tall. 1,500 feet. 100 feet wide, 100 feet off the ground. And then, and then uh, with this uh, you know, Microsoft animation program, we constructed this layered process of, of making a digital movie. Now, the inside, you know, in the, in the, in the dome of the, of the screen, there are uh, uh, kind of like bricks with 24 lights. And there's 70, 000, no, 70 million of those lights. You can imagine, they go 1,500 feet down wow. and 100 feet wide. And the computer then generates the animation you know, from the little headquarters there you know, over into that dome. You know? And I, so I had this image, you know, all these images going back and forth, collaging back and forth. You know, it was absolutely amazing. And, um, it was, it was back there for like eight things. years. You did, you did kind of the same thing at the Shrine Hall with your, you had a big screen. Yeah, so it was like a continuation of that, yeah. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, so Chouinard learning about, about video and technology and all that, and then, <clears throat> and then Pinnacle, uh, working with the light show people and all that, learning about all that stuff. So when, when, uh, 19, when 2009 came around and they offered that to me, I said, wow. Yeah. But, other questions? Go ahead, Adam. Now, some of your black and white and comic book kind of stuff reminds me of the art behind me by Raymond Pettibon, who did Black Flag stuff. And I'm wondering, just curious, is there any connections? Do you know each other? No, just, okay. No, we're just all artists dreaming. <laughs> some dreams go along with other dreams, and some dreams don't. But, uh, or he may have been influenced oh, by you. No doubt. Yeah. No yeah. Doubt. Shepard Ferry was influenced by him. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Jimi Hendrix poster, so Shepard Ferry has yes. a, talks about him being well, influenced. He was in the video. Yeah, he keeps yeah. sending me money, you know. <laughs> He's guilty, but he keeps sending me money. Do yeah. <laughs> you have a question here? John, I saw some of your posts from the big swell uh, that happened a few weeks ago. Does that mean it's... You posted some pictures of a big swell in Granada Bay? I think people... Yeah, but that's a funny one, yeah. Uh, is somebody heading back to the beach? <laughs> yeah, so I went and bought uh, a, a Leica um, 2L, something like that, um, that has 47 megabytes to it, you know, and I had a 135 millimeter lens. And when you're in Lanada Bay there, and on a big day, you can't see anybody really, you know, it's like way out there. So that camera, I held it up and I took pictures, you know, not knowing what I was actually taking. And I went back to the studio and put it onto the, the computer, and I realized there were some guys out there. <laughs> <laughs> You know, surprise. And, and so, so at you know at 47 megabytes, uh, the shot that I took out of it was like 22 megabytes. So you know it's just amazing what uh, you can do with those cameras. Speaking of Lanada Bay, when you left the surf industry artistically, did you continue surfing? Did you, keep, did you keep surfing after you left the industry? You went to Ferris? Yeah, my surf world, you know, uh, is that uh, after 10 some odd years with uh, Becker, I, I then go to school and, you know, the city and all that. And then I move back to, or I, 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 leave the, I leave the city at the end of the album cover and the starting of the disc and, and videotapes and all that. And I moved to Malibu. I had a house there. And... Uh, and so I spent probably 12 years there, 13 years surfing again, you know, with everybody and uh, uh, designing the Jimmy Z campaign and uh, Gotcha Sportswear, all their campaigns. So all that stuff is even old too, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I, I guess a long time ago. Still going in the water. You know, just, do you, she wants to know if you're still surfing. When did you last surf? I, you know, I stopped in 92 because the water uh, was really, uh, Ill, you know, ill feeling. Uh, I, uh, my doctor sort of advised me to stay away from Malibu, so I was surfing uh, at Point Doom. Um, 
And, and then the sun, you know, for me is being so fair, uh, when I was a surfer, they would call it the reflector. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for having a tan. So that those, those six hours in the water, yeah. and I would wear, a, you know, a, 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 a thin wetsuit up to my neck, you know, and, uh, and then just take that 100 and, you know, just put it all over my face, but still, you know, the burns were awful. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? Was that, your, was that your garage that had like a, a sign on it when, on the Coast Highway? When you go down the Coast Highway, it was, there you, was a garage in the 80s or the 70s? It, was it Coast of Mesa? Or? No, in Malibu. Oh, oh in Malibu? Malibu, yeah. yeah. Did, 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 did you put a graphic on it? Yeah, it built a facade. What? You built a facade, but you know, a big grace of the facade. No, I mean, it had a, I thought there was a, um, an artwork of yours on the garage door. Oh. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's, that's, any artwork on the garage door? Okay, I thought it was yours. I always it thought it was yours. Because it was someone who owned Surfer Magazine. It was, um, uh, uh, someone had a garage door that looked like your, looked like your work mm -hmm. in Malibu? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, I think it was great. I really yeah. liked it. Yay. I'm sorry for the emotion.